Good morning. I want to start off by saying Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. We are indeed so grateful for our mothers. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Not only physically, but probably wouldn't be in this place worshiping God in spirit and in truth if it, in truth if it wasn't for godly mothers. Amen? Amen. So we're thankful for them. We praise God. We hope that you enjoy time with family and friends today and, and know that you are loved and that you are appreciated. But when I went to prepare this lesson about a month ago, I had no idea I'd be preaching on Mother's Day. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say about it. Happy Mother's Day, and I hope you certainly enjoy your day today. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. As Connor read for us, we will look at uh, verses 14 and following. John 10. You know, when God chose to <clears throat> use an animal to describe his people, he could have chose a lot of different animals. I mean, he could have chose a gazelle. Gazelles are beautiful and graceful. He, he could have chose uh, a cheetah. I mean, cheetahs can run 60 miles an hour. I mean, that's, that's fast. He could have even ch chosen a dog. I mean, we all love dogs, right? Well, most people. Um, they're man's best friend. Who doesn't like dogs? But he decided to choose sheep. Sheep. Now, uh, it's kind of obvious. Back then in Bible times, shepherding sheep was something that uh, was very commonplace, right? Um, you had a lot of shepherds. You had a lot of sheep. So... We can see Jesus using that <clears throat> analogy um, very simply. I mean, it's kind of like us using a cell phone today as an analogy. Everybody pretty much has one. We know what they're all about or social media or something like that. And it's easy to relate to it. But I want to suggest to you this morning that there's a deeper reason why God used sheep to describe his people. And we'll begin... And looking at what Jesus said, actually we're going to back up to verse 11 in John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because... He is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. In other words, I know them and they know me. And as the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I love this part. And I lay down my life for the sheep. So upon this, uh, up to this point, Jesus is talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the Jews. He's trying to convince them that he is indeed the Messiah. If you look down to verse 24, they said, if you are the Christ, just tell us plainly. And Jesus said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because what? You are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never perish. So we see on the day of Pentecost, there were thousands of Jews that obeyed the gospel and believed in who Jesus was. They believed that he was indeed the Messiah. But now if we go back... To verse 16, Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, right? So now he's adding the Gentiles. He's adding you and me to this one flock with that one shepherd. And that's what we heard about last week. The one body of Christ, the one church last weekend. And again, want to thank Steve for that, putting together that wonderful uh, conference on the uniqueness of the Lord's church. So Jesus is the good shepherd and we are his sheep. Now notice what David wrote in this very familiar Psalm, Psalm 23, if you want to turn there. Psalm 23, we're very familiar with it. It's usually uh, read at funerals, unfortunately. Um, but it's a good thing. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. So if the Lord is his shepherd, what's that, what's make, what's that make David? A sheep, right? And he says, I shall not want, I, I, I shall uh, be lacking nothing. But verse 2 is what I want, to, want you to focus on. Verse 2 is what I want you to focus on. He says, he, he makes me or he causes me to lie down in green pastures. You see, one characteristic of sheep is that it's not very easy for them to lie down. They're very skittish. And it's hard for them to be at peace and to lie down. So when David says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, that's a very powerful statement. Because sheep don't generally lie down. It's very hard for them to lie down. It's difficult. But, uh, but David says, he maketh me, he causes me to lie down in a peaceful, tranqu tranqu uh, tranquil um, green pasture, right? In tranquility. So I want to share with you this morning four things that will hinder a sheep from lying down. Four things that will hinder a sheep from lying down. The first one is fear. Fear. Now, Jesus said the hireling... He doesn't care about the sheep. So when the wolf comes, the sheep are all fearful. The, the wolf grabs one of them and the rest of them all scatter. Right? Very fearful situation. But not so when the good shepherd is near. Not so. The apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, For God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind. So when you're close to the chief shepherd and the good shepherd, you have a sound mind. There's nothing to fear. Paul also wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious or fearful, another word for fear, about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guarded from what, Paul? From fear. From anxiety, from worry, from doubt. Fear is founded on a lack of trust. Do we trust the hireling? No, we don't, we don't trust the hiring. Why not? Because the sheep, the, the sheep are not his. They're not owned by him. He doesn't care about them. He doesn't love them. But can we trust the good shepherd? Oh, yeah, we can trust him. We can trust him. Because he owns the sheep. The sheep are his. They're known by him and, and he knows them. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. But what's the first thing that Paul says to do? Be anxious for nothing but pray. Let your prayer and petition be known to God, right? And remember in Psalm 23, David said, 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Right? And we say, well, yeah, maybe that's uh, leading, leading towards death. But let's be honest. As we walk through this life, this sinful, uh, tarnished life, this toxic life that we, we live in and this world we live in, it's almost like walking through a shadow of death sometimes, isn't it? David says, I will fear no, e fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, when that wolf comes and they start to get a little skittish, they look up at the, the shepherd and they see he's standing there firm with his staff. And believe me, he knows how to yield that staff if he needs to, right? Whack one of those wolves upside the head. Oh, yeah, if he needs to. And so his rod and his staff comforts him and, and, and he's able to lie down in that green pasture. He knows the good shepherd is there. You know, Jesus is still our good shepherd. And he still knows how to yield his rod. Isaiah, God said to Isaiah in Isaiah 49 and verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I love how God just, he adds that yes in there. It's because he can almost hear the doubt and, and the lack of trust already coming from uh, Isaiah. And, he, and so he says, I will strengthen you. Yes, I, I will help you. Yes, I will. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So if we're fearful, it's going to be, going to be difficult for us to lie down. But David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Number two, second reason why sheep will not lie down is because of tension or friction with other sheep. Now by design, sheep are, are, are designed by God to gather into flocks, right? To be together, and that's a good thing. They don't mind being together with one another. But when you're get, gathered together like that as sheep close together, there's going to be some friction. You might bump against each other a little bit, or you might rub against each other a, a little bit, or you might uh, get a, a toe stepped on or something like that. You just might get rubbed the wrong way. When you're close together like that as sheep. But that's how God designed them. And it's a safety mechanism as well. It's good for us to be together. Right? But things can happen when you're in close proximity with each other. Think you, there's that friction that can happen, right? Of course, we won't step on somebody's toe on purpose, will we? But we have to be careful how we, how we speak to one another, right? There are a lot of things in the world that are frustrating, and they frustrate us, and they may cause our countenance to fall and, our, and things uh, to change our attitude. But when we come amongst the, 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 the members of the church, we have to be careful not to let that attitude spread amongst the, the brethren, right? Um, but to be positive, not to say that you can't share what you're, what's hurting and, and, and because we want to pray for you, we want to help you in a, in, 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 in a lot of ways. And, and so we do that with one another. We share things that are going on in our lives. But we have to make sure that we're not being rude or we're not being uh, distasteful or we're just being careful in how we speak so that we don't cause any friction. Right? And it can't just be, it can just be body language as well. But I have to say in this congregation, we do a really good job of just loving on each other, right? We're just loving on each other. And that's what uh, the church should be. It should be a place of refuge from the world, right? There's so much negativity out there. When we come uh, amongst each other, it should be so joyous and so wonderful that we don't want to leave and that we see that happening sometimes in the foyer and as the lights are being turned out, people are still fellowshipping with each other and still talking and still enjoying 
each other's company. That's a beautiful thing. You know, we, uh, we harp on Hebrews 10.25 a lot. You know, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But the latter part of that verse is actually probably more important, where he says, exhorting one another. That word exhorting means to strongly encourage or to urge or to push forward. Who here has, has run a, uh, a half marathon or, or a marathon? Raise your hand. Few, few people here and there, yeah. Or a 5K, who's on a 5K? All right. Okay, yeah, good. So the goal of the 5K or the marathon or whatever is not necessarily how you run, run it. And of course, we try to get the fastest speed or whatever, the fastest time. But the goal is what? Just to finish. Yeah, to finish. And so heaven is our finish line. And so when we get together, when we, ex- we want to be exhorting one another, it's kind of like you're standing at the end of that finish line and, and you're saying, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Finish. Finish the race. And that's what we're saying to one another. And that's what that means where he says, exhorting one another in love and good works. Let's keep running this race for Christ. We can finish. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying there. And then if we back up to the previous verse, he said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Stir up. Y'all remember Kool-Aid? Remember Kool-Aid? Back in the, the young people don't know nothing about Kool-Aid or whatever, but we, we know, especially if you didn't have a whole lot when you were younger. You remember Kool-Aid. Mom would have a big jug of water, maybe some ice, right? Take that little packet of Kool-Aid and drop it in there. And all it was was sugar, maybe some red dye number five, and, uh, and a little bit of citrus flavor, right? And she'd stir that up. Get that wooden spoon, stir it up. Yeah. But after a while, it'd be in the fridge, and it would just kind of start to settle. And if you try to drink that, oh, man, that tastes nasty, right? So what do you got to do? You got to stir it up. Yeah, get it going again, right? And that's what we do when we're together like that. We stir each other up, right? Get us tasting good again, right? And that's what it's all about when we come together. He says, stir one another up to, for good works. And we do a good job of that. We have a lot of things going on in this congregation, going out and helping people. And we got Bible studies and folks getting baptized. And we got studies here and there. And, and amazing, reaching out to the community and individually. Let's stir each other up. But when there's friction, it's difficult. When there's tension, where there's stress, sheep will not lie down. They will not be peaceful. Number three, they will not lie down when they're tormented by fleas and parasites. If their physical health is compromised, if they're irritated or aggravated by physical ailments, they won't lie down. But God wants us to take good care of our physical bodies to the best of our ability, right? You know, with age comes issues. Believe me, I know, getting a little older and you wake up and, oh, where'd that pain come from? (laughs) You know, didn't have that yesterday. But what's the old adage? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, so we have to do what we can. Paul said to Timothy that physical exercise is profitable. He says profits a little bit, but he did say it's profitable. In uh, 1 Timothy 4, 8. Back then, they didn't need physical exercise. I mean, their lifestyle was physical, right? I mean, they were carpenters. They were blacksmiths. They were out in farming. They were doing a lot of physical work. To us, our lives are very sedentary nowadays. I don't know about you, but this is about all the... the the exercise I get during the day. My fingers get a lot of exercise, right? Yeah, this is all I'm doing. I might use the mouse a little bit. My shoulder gets a little workout, you know, with the mouse. 
Yeah, 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 now I'm really working out. But that's how, that's how our lifestyle, right? So, so we, need to get, we need to make that a part of our lifestyle. I, I need to get that exercise because the Bible does tell us that it is profitable. But more importantly, we need to understand that our bodies belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 19. Now, the context, of course, is regarding sexual immorality, but I want to focus on the ownership here, okay? Verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6, Or do you not know that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. What was the price? The death of, death of the only begotten Son of God, right? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are yours. Is that what the Bible says? No, it doesn't say yours. It says, which are God's. It says, which are God's, right? See, when you became a Christian, you relinquished the ownership of your body. You relinquished the ownership of your body. Now, we used to say, hey, this is my body. I'll do whatever I want with it, right? Not so as a Christian. That's why we don't smoke. That's why we don't drink alcohol. That's why we don't uh, commit sexual immorality. That's why we don't put toxic foods in our bodies because we don't want to defile the temple of God. It's not ours anymore. It's owned by God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. In verse 27, he said, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. The de the, basically, the desires of my body don't control me. I control it, is what Paul's saying. Lest when I have preached to others, I, may, uh, I, I myself should be disqualified. Disqualified from what? From obtaining that imperishable crown that he talks about in that passage. Right? But he says, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Now, I like how the NIV deals with the previous verse, verse 26. Because it's read like this. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, uh, just running everywhere, not having a direction. Right? And watch this. And I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. You ever watch it when boxers are just... And one of the things I used to love doing when I was a kid uh, or when I was younger, it's really one of the only things I really did with my father was to watch boxing on ESPN or on uh, HBO. We, lo we both loved to watch boxing for some reason. Um, and you would have the boxers, and they would just be shadow boxing sometimes, just practice, and they're not, they're not hitting anybody, they're not doing anything. Right? And sometimes, even when they get in the ring and they start boxing, their opponent, they'll throw a couple, you know, jabs here and there, but they're not hitting anything. It's kind of getting warmed up or whatever, just kind of measuring each other out, right? And Paul uses this analogy here and he says, I, you know, I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. And I make it my slave. Now, that's figurative, of course. We don't want to go too far with that because there are some folks that think that they can hurt themselves and make themselves more righteous and strike their body, and we don't want to go there. But he's basically talking about discipline, and he says, I discipline my body. Mind over matter, right? He says, my physical desires don't dictate my actions. Remember when Mike Tyson used to knock people out in 90 seconds? He didn't play, man. He'd be there in the ring for about a minute and a half, and then, bow! That uppercut, and they'd be out, lights out. I'm talking about a 280, 6'4 guy, and he would just give him a knockout blow, and out. That's what Paul is saying about our physical desires that are contrary to God's will, give them a knockout blow. And how do we do it? 
The only way we can do it is with God's word. Right? When Jesus was tempted, what did he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. We have to know his word. Get behind me, Satan. Thus saith the Lord. Blah, blah, blah. Right? And be focused on wanting to have that discipline. Let the Spirit of God throw that knockout punch so we have to be in tune with it, right? We have to decide. It has to be a conscious decision to bring our bodies into the subjection to the Word of the Lord and to His Spirit. Nick Foles, one of my favorite people, backup quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, won the Super Bowl for him and helped win the Super Bowl for him in 2017 was the uh, Super Bowl MVP that year. And uh, I'm just finishing up his book called Believe It. And he said this at the end of his book, you don't have to be the best in order to try your best or to do your best. You don't have to be the best. We know we're not the best, but we can try our best. Amen? We can try our best. I like to say, and you probably heard me say this, do your best and let God do the rest. Right? Do your best and let God do the rest. Because uh, a a sheep, when it's irritated, when it's aggravated, when it has physical ailments, it's tough for it to lie down. It's tough for it to be at peace in the green pastures of life. Number four last thing this morning that will hinder a sheep from lying down is when it's hungry or thirsty. When it's hungry or thirsty. Have you ever been hangry? Have you ever been hangry? Where you're so hungry you're angry? Yeah, I mean, it could change your whole disposition, right? I mean, your whole attitude until you get something to eat. We don't like being hungry. So my question for you this morning is, when you are hungry, what are you hungry for? Chick-fil-A? Don't go there. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's what Jesus said. I don't know what it is about cotton candy, but when I was a kid, I used to love it. Didn't you love cotton candy? I used to love the way they make it, watch them make it, and they, you know, put that little uh, cardboard thing in, the, in the, it's all hot, and it just kind of comes out, and you got this big ball of cotton candy. And then you go to eat it, and you put it in your mouth, and it just dissolves like that. It's gone. So you put more in your mouth, and it, gets, it dissolves real quick. And next thing you know, you're just left with an empty cardboard stick, and it's all gone. And it was like that. It was this big. But it just dissolved away so quickly. Not really filling, right? Probably after that, you're looking for some funnel cake or something like that because you want <laughs> You know, it just didn't really do you any. But that's how the... How, The world is, and and, and the world is kind of like cotton candy. It's just a whole lot of nothing. So we have to be careful not to cling to the world. You know, 1 John said that, you know, John said in 1 John that, you know, we have to be careful not to love the world and the things of the world. It's a whole lot of nothing sometimes need to be making reservations to sit at the Lord's table and sup with him as often as possible. Am I right about it? Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. He also said in John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. He or she will live forever. How do we eat the bread of life? 
Jesus said in John 12, 48, he who, who, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus talking to the woman at the well John 4 said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. It's temporary, right? That physical water. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will come in him as a fountain of, of water springing up into eternal life. In other words, we can quench our physical thirst thirst with water, but it's temporary. In a little while, we'll be thirsty again. But when we quench our thirst with the righteousness of God, with his eternal word, with the fellowship of the saints, then that can last forever. My brother-in-law said, the only thing you can take with you into heaven is relationships. That is so true. Build that relationship and you both get in Christ. Stay faithful until death. You can take that to heaven. Not a whole lot else. Our thirst will be quenched not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Notice Jesus said that it will become in him a fountain of water springing up in him. From the inside out. Not from the outside in. God's fulfillment comes from within and lasts for all eternity. But when sheep are hungry and thirsty, they won't lie down. If they go too long without nourishment, they'll die. Hosea, in Hosea 4, 6, God said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. What type of knowledge? is going to nourish our souls and quench our spiritual thirst for all eternity? Well, Jesus said it, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And of course, that word abide has to do with a continual feasting on his word, a continual daily feasting on his word. Four reasons why sheep will not lie down when they're full of fear, when there's tension and friction amongst other sheep, when they're tormented by physical ailments, or when they're hungry and thirsty. But there's good news. There's a good shepherd who can keep his sheep from experiencing all of those things. All of those things and all of those prom problems. The good shepherd can keep them from experiencing those. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want of anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The good shepherd gives to his sheep confidence peace, healing, and sustenance. Simply by his sheep knowing that he's near, that he's watching, that he owns them, that he loves them, and that he died for them. Is the Lord your shepherd this morning? Are you one of his sheep? You can be one. By believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins, being, confessing him, and being buried with Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have that need or if you have a need where you want the church to pray for you, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.